Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on our leaders. Today we will be covering Vladimir Putin from Russia and Moon Jae-in from the Republic Korea or South Korea, as it is commonly referred to. So these are two very, very interesting lives, um, I believe, and I believe you will find too after watching this video. And surprisingly, there are a lot more similarities between these two individuals than one might expect, especially considering one is um, has held power for a lot longer and had started much earlier, whereas the other, the latter, Moon Jae-in, only just recently came into power. However, there are a lot more similarities between their two lives, particularly how they both attained the power itself. So I think this will be a very interesting video. So nonetheless, without further ado, we'll begin with Vladimir Putin. So Vladimir Putin is the uh, Russian politician and current president of Russia, and he has held this position since 2012. However, he also held this position from the years 1998 to 2008. He briefly had to end this, um, this, uh, this period of presidency due to the laws restricting how long one can hold this position. So between 2008 to 2012, he served a term as prime minister of Russia as well. He was born in Leningrad, which is now known as St. Petersburg, and as it had formerly been called St. Petersburg before it got changed to Leningrad and then back to St. Petersburg. And he studied law at Leningrad State University, where he graduated in 1975 when he was 23 years old. Uh, the university is now called St. Petersburg State University, and it's generally considered probably the, the third best university in um, in Russia, or at least it is the best in St. Petersburg. There are a couple other uh, universities that um, debatably might take the top spot in Russia, but nonetheless, it's the best in his city, that, the city that he grew up in. He worked as a KGB foreign intelligence officer for 16 years, rising the ranks for all the way up to lieutenant colonel. He ultimately resigned in 1991 at 39 years old to begin a career in politics in St. Petersburg. In 1996, he served in under uh, under Boris Yeltsin in Moscow, um, who was president at the time on his administration as director of this Federal Security Service, the FSB, which is now the modern day KGB. He was ultimately appointed prime minister in August of 1999 after Yeltsin resigned as he was Yeltsin's favorite, and uh, thus he was elected president. But we'll get more into his presidency and his later life after we cover his early life. So, he was born in on October 7th of 1952. He was the third of the three children of Vladimir Spirodonovich Putin, um, who actually only died in 1999, coincidentally, the, the year he resigned from uh, the KGB. As well, um, his father was actually a cook for Vladimir Lenin, who was uh, during his time of power, so a um, indirectly pretty powerful position in the KGB, but nonetheless he must have been someone that was undoubtedly trusted by Vladimir Lenin, which is important to note. His mother um, was Mir Maria Ivanovich Putina, um, as in Russian the, the female takes the feminine version of the last name, and she actually served as a, uh, a laborer during World War II. So at the time of his birth, Leningrad was part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic in the Soviet Union. Um, his older brothers were Albert, who died in infancy, and Victor, who died of bacterial infection during the siege of Leningrad in World War II. So fortunate that his father named his third son after himself and he actually lived because he didn't have the same um, the same luck with his first two sons. So during this siege of Leningrad by Nazi Germany, when Nazi Germany had invaded Russia, his mother was a factory worker and his father was a conscript in the Soviet Navy. So um, um, he also, in the early part of World War II, he served as a submarine fleet in the early 1930s. As well, he was part of the Destruction Battalion of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs. And later, he was just a, uh, he became a regular army um, 
soldier, and he was wounded severely in 1942. But nonetheless, I think his, his efforts and commitment to the army, as well as um, the sacrifice that he made, made him a trustworthy individual to ultimately become the personal chef of Vladimir Lenin. His maternal grandmother was killed in Tver region in 1941 by the German Nazi occupation, as well as all of his maternal uncles were lost in the war front. So um, obviously a lot of uh, uh, bloodshed in the history of his family. And that probably had some sort of implication on his um, later toughness. On September 1st of 1960, when he was um, eight years old, he started at school number 193 at on Baskar Lane, Baskar Lane. Um, he was one of the few, so the class was a pretty small class size of about 45, and supposedly he was one of the only students who was not part of the uh, young pioneer organization, which is Scouts. So what can we derive from this? Um, I don't think we can conclude that he was an outcast, but maybe he wasn't as interested in um, um, essentially playing with the other children, we could call it. At 12 years old, he began Sambo and Judo. He wished to, because he had watched a lot of Soviet uh, cinema, and he admired the officers who were good at hand-to-hand -hand combat. So he became a, and he is a national master of sports in Sambo, and he's a black belt in Judo. So um, maybe not so much today as he's gotten older, but definitely one who would be uh, physically intimidating. He studied at St. Petersburg High School, um, 281, where he studied Ju German, and he speaks fluently, which I think is um, maybe a little bit ironic considering the, the how, how the German occupation or the Nazi occupation affected him and his family and how, how many of his ancestors on his mother's side had actually died from German, um, and he learned the German language, which I consider a little bit of ironicity, and he later ends up working in Germany as well, so or East Germany at least, which is, I think, a little bit... Um, a little bit of irony. He st studied law at Leningrad State, um, which is now St. Petersburg State, which is the, the considered the best university in, in St. Petersburg. However, um, uh, there are others in Moscow which might claim the title of the, of the best, but uh, nonetheless, I think we can conclude that he was a, a pretty good student, and as we'll see with his ability to get mentorship as well. So, uh, he also, it's, uh, yeah, the other two universities in Moscow are the National Research in, in University of Higher, of Higher School of Economics and the Moscow State University, which by uh, most rankings placed top, but maybe he wanted to stay closer to home, or maybe he did not, um, yeah, there are a variety of reasons, but I think the important thing to note is that not everyone needs to go to the, uh, the, the, the pinnacle of education. But I do consider he was at the pinnacle of edu education. But nonetheless, um, that's where he ended himself up. So, and he studied here from 1970 to 1975. And he wrote his thesis on the most favored nation trading principle in international law. So, the, this is a, it's called MFN status. It's basically um, when one nation gives MFN status, most favorable nation status, that nation has um, advantageous um um, capacities in terms of trade and in terms of tariffs. So it's sort of, um, I guess, I guess the point to note here is that his passions were beyond just beyond specifically law, but law and economics or law and international trade or law and business. His mentor was a business law professor, as one might expect, Anatoly Sobchak, um, who was an assistant professor at that time, but he's also ultimately a very important mentor in Putin's life as later he ultimately becomes mayor of St. Petersburg, as we'll see. So he's a very important, um, this important connection that he made early on was very important. And it's interesting that either um, this rising political individual either scouted Putin or Putin scouted him, but nonetheless he managed, and throughout his whole life, same thing with Boris Yeltsin, he always seems to know and be associated with the right people. Uh, he, during this time, he was required to join the Communist Party of the Soviet Union during his university studies, and he remained in this party until 1991. Later in 1999, he reflects, however, and as we'll quote, the quote says here, 
communism is a blind alley far away from mainstream civilization. So he's obviously um, uh, not a, a diehard communist, but he was forced into doing this. And I think he just, you know, he, he accepted this role because it would help his uh, political rise. Uh, so ultimately after graduating, he joins the KGB and he trained at the 401st KGB school in Leningrad. After training, he worked in second chief directorate, which is a counterintelligence um, department. And then he later transferred to the first chief directorate where he was um, worked in monitoring foreigners and consular officials in Leningrad. So kind of... Um, or always gathering information for this uh, for the spies um, within uh, Leningrad or on spying on officials who were in Leningrad and consular officials in 1984 um, important date just because the book 1984 um, he went to Mo uh, he went to Moscow to further his training at the Yuri Andropov Red Banner Institute so further furthering his career in the KGB and in the Central Intelligence. In 1985 to 1990, he went to Dresden, East Germany, where he was used the cover identity as a translator, but really he was um, supposedly supposed to spy for the KGB to find out if anyone were sort of um, uh, just doing anything that the KGB would not support or the Soviet Union. But supposedly, according to some historians, his work did not actually include too much spying. It mostly involved just the uh, collecting of uh, supposedly useless press clippings. So he wasn't doing uh, too much unethical, one might uh, consider. In the, on the fall of the Berlin Wall, which started on the 9th of November 1989, it's uh, in one of his biographies, it said that he burned all the KGB files that he had collected to hide them from uh, demonstrators. So um, at least even though the things were falling out in the KGB and the Soviet Union, he stayed loyal up until this point. Um, after the collapse of the East German government in 1990, he returned to Leningrad. And for three months, he studied with the, the International Affairs Department of Leningrad State University, his alma mater. And there he continued his uh, relationship with um, uh, his Anatoly, his mentor. He recruited for KGB uh, and reported on the student. During this time at the university, he co work, continued to work for the KGB reporting for um, the KGB recruiting students and spying on the student population. Um, ultimately, Anatoly Sobchak, his mentor, would go on to become the mayor of Leningrad, which was hugely important in his political rise. He resigned the rank of lieutenant colonel, which is the highest rank he achieved in the KGB, on the 20th, 20th of August 1991. This was the second day of the 1991 um, coup against the Soviet uh, government and um, which was uh, a Soviet coup against Mikhail Gorbachev who um, was actually probably the first um, political leader I saw with my own two eyes with, with the exception of um, um, I guess the Prime Minister of Canada uh, Gorbachev came to speak at this um, big uh, arena here and I got to see him speak and it really yeah, inspired me and I think it was probably a very um, influential Thing, at least in terms of growing my passion for politics, some of the things that he said during that speech are, you know, just, um, uh, you know, essentially the love what you do and such. And obviously his passion for politics was very clear. And I think coming from such a great and important individual, it at least meant a lot for my life. So during the coup against Mikhail Gorbachev, he left the, um, the KGB. He said, uh, here's the quote, as soon as the coup began, I immediately decided which side I was on. Um, so obviously he chose it to um, go for the democratic side, but it was hard having spent the best part of his life with the organ. So he had committed his whole life as a KGB officer and you know committing himself to the, uh, the communist or Soviet government. And then he sort of had to just give it up and just left as a, as a colonel, lieutenant colonel of the KGB, which would have been difficult. Felt like he's probably making a huge career leap, stepping off a, a cliff. But with this, fortunately, his his mentor, Anatoly Sobchak, became mayor of the Petersburg government, which very, um, very much he 
helped him rise in terms of political influence and it always in, uh, helped him attain and maintain employment during these difficult times. Similarly enough, he also gets associated with Boris Yeltsin, as we'll soon see, who, is, who ultimately um, got him into as deputy chief of the presidential staff, and he was um, later appoints him as head of the FSB, which is the new equivalent of the KGB, so he sort of got to maintain his high status or high position, and um, ultimately Yeltsin chose Putin as his successor for president of Russia. So Putin was always extremely effective in in um, in having great mentors who were able to uh, not only climb themselves but help him in climbing. So he was uh, appointed uh, so by Boris Yeltsin to be the administration on the administration as director of uh, federal federal security service, which is the the. KGB's um, successor agency, and then he was appointed prime minister um, with the help of Yeltsin in August of 1999. And in that same year, Yeltsin resigned, and Putin was elected president. So very much, uh, Yeltsin was hugely influential in his own career. Whereas Putin actually didn't get too much spotlight, but just his association with Yeltsin allowed him to catapult himself directly almost into presidency. In his first tenure, um, the Russian economy grew eight straight years with GDP, as measured by purchasing power, increased 72%. This was, some say, caused by the 2000s commodities boom, recovery from the post-communist depression, as well as the, um, the dot-com bubble, the 2000s crisis, and essentially just as well his own and his office's prudent economic and fiscal policy so much has to also be credited to his own abilities he during um 2008 to 2012 in the, the russia it's one cannot serve um uh three consecutive terms so from 2008 to 2012 he uh let dmitry medev uh medvedev medev uh medvedev become um pardon me for that uh become president for one term while he served as prime minister. But in all intents and purposes, I think most people consider that Putin still held the power because in 2012, he sought a third term and he won the March 2012 election with 64% of the vote. Uh, in this second tenure, GDP actually started to decline. However, uh, this was largely caused by the falling of oil prices. Russia is very, very, um, uh, Russian economy is heavily tied to the oil industry. And uh, I would say even now more than ever, oil prices are going down lower and lower. This is um, uh, at the time of filming this. This is the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. So oil prices are going very low. So the Russian economy is hurting at the moment. As well, international sanctions began in 2014 due to the annexation of Crimea, as well as just generally the military intervention in the uh, eastern Ukraine region has caused for further sanctions, which have, um, in 2015 alone, GDP declined by 3.7%. In um, At the end of his most recent election, however, um, the economy increased by 0.3%, so finally the the, the recent Russian um, uh, recession has has ended. And this was in the, the March 2018 election. He won by 76% of the vote, and he won an unprecedented six-year term, which should end in 2024. So this is normal terms are four years, this time it's six. And his, um, his last election, he won by 64% of the vote. Now he had won by 76%. So he's, um, he, he has gained debatably more relative power. In terms of criticisms during this period, um, some say that the Russia has, has been backsliding in terms of democracy. There have, he's been attributed to many purges and jailings of his political opponents. Supposedly he's curtailed press freedom and as lack of fair and free elections have been attributed to his governancy. Also, some, um, some people consider him to have some business corruption. He is a billionaire. He has attained a lot of wealth for one who has stayed in a political career um, his whole life. That is um, by some considered to be questionable. 
the country has scored poorly in the Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perceptions Index, the Economist Intelligent Units Democracy Index, and Freedom House's Freedom and World Index, um, where the country actually received a record low rating in 2017, 20 out of 100, which was the lowest since Soviet Union times. Supposedly, he's had some persecution of political critics and activists, as well as tortures and even assassinations, um, but he denies any of these human rights abuses. He also has recent accusations of interference with the 2016 U.S. presidential election, where supposedly um, someone from Donald Trump's staff approached somebody from the FSB to find some uh, dirt on uh, Hillary Clinton. To what extent this was true? Uh, it's hard to say, and nonetheless, I don't think, um, at least in terms outcome-wise, I don't think they really found anything that wasn't um, uh, readily available. Um, but uh, I guess, nonetheless, um, to, to, to try to cover up whether he is good or whether he's, he is bad, I'd like to reference the important uh, intellectual that being uh, a Russian intellectual Tolstoy. So with, in Tolstoy's great tomb, Ro uh, War and Peace, he, um, and this, he says that uh, many people prescribe to what's called great man philosophy in that, for example, and his reference was to Napoleon Bonaparte during the, the 1900s and during his invasion into Russia. So he considers it not only a... Um, uh, uh, misattribution but also a fallacy to consider that it is great men who really move civilizations he states that it was napoleon was rather the product of the desires of the french people in the aftermath of the french revolution simply wanted to um, do this and napoleon was just the one who gave them the wishes that they desired a modern example could also be referenced with respect to adolf hitler um or more modern in that it was um, Hitler was obviously um, a, a very um, um, a powerful individual. However, the masses of the German people probably were also enabling this. So I guess with respect to um, Putin, on either in Putin, I suppose I'll call it Putin's defense. And as I said, my bias with respect to all of these leaders, I'll generally be in favor of them just because I think. Um, at least I admire all these leaders for having attained their position, and I think there's a plethora of negative information on them already. But with respect to Putin, you can either prescribe to the Tolstoyan argument or the non-Tolstoyan argument, but I think in both cases he is generally defended. In the Tolstoyan argument, one might say that Putin is just the result of some of the underlying desires of the of the um, Russian people, or at least the Russian government, and Putin came into power because he is the facilitator. Tolstoy uses the analogy of a pyramid in that people at the, the lowest rung of the pyramid have the most actual freedom, in that if you are like a foot soldier, he uses the example, one can and can kill, one can not kill, one can loot, one can not loot. However, um, a general, for example, um, don't really have much control. They can tell the individual to kill, they can tell the individual not to kill, but they might still do whatever they want. And as they move more and more up the dominance hierarchy, they get actual, actually and um, um, counterintuitively less power. So with this, you could say that Putin is just a facilitator of some of the desires of many of the, of the desires that are prominent and um, a lot permitted through the Russian population, and that would be the Tolstoyan argument, and that would say that uh, he is just the product of some of the wishes of the of the of the Russian people. And with that, I think we can we can kind of safely say that he is um, he cannot be blamed or cannot be not blamed in that he is uh, just the product. And if he were to leave, someone else would probably take his position. And I think that's kind of evident throughout his whole career. I think the reason why he was um, rose through the ranks so quickly in the KGB and through the governancy of um, St. Petersburg and through the governancy in the, uh, of Russia is that he was always uh, just a diligent worker and he sort of always obeyed rules and he sort of was just a facilitator. Um, Tolstoy says the more friction that one causes, the harder it is for them to rise in the ranks, whereas one who is just sort of gives least friction will rise to the top the fastest. So perhaps he is just a facilitator. And through that, you know, some of these killings, I don't think 
he is necessarily killing these people um, if there are these killings of political opponents going on, but it is sort of just the cause of the um, of the general population. Then if you disagree with the Tolstoy argument and you think that there are great heroes and great heroes do cause um, all events, it is, uh, for example, the great leaders such as um, Napoleon or Alexander the Great who changed the world and everyone else sort of just follows in their sway, that would be the non tolstoyan argument, then you must credit everything to Putin. And by doing that, you'd have to credit not only the bad things, but all of the good things as well. And by doing so, you'd also have to credit the, the huge economic prosperity that Russia has experienced throughout its, its period. And, um, and if you do attribute, attribute the great hero um, hypothesis to him, I think you have to apply it equally in that he has done all the good and he has done all the bad so i think uh with both arguments i think he could be considered either um not good or not bad or at least um uh, debatably good or debatably bad but uh that would just be my defense of of, of putin um yeah so that's vladimir putin i guess we'll go through the quotes and then i'll get into uh, Moon Jae In. Uh, I've gone through these two. It is a betrayal to be hanged for loyalty. It is better to be hanged for loyalty than to be rewarded for betrayal. So um, that's just part of um, just kind of indicative of his of his honor, I guess you could call it. Sometimes it is better to do things faster, even if they give an error, than to do nothing. Um, that is, I think that I think parallels the the quote that I finished the last video series with. Without a certain amount of arbitrariness, some things get done. Sometimes it's just you know, how do you write an essay? Well, first just write a horrible first draft and then and then iterate it. But um, to do nothing is um, is worse than to do something poorly. And I think that's uh, paralleled in this statement. So I very much like that one. And then lastly, you can do a lot more with weapons and politeness than just politeness. So this is um, just indicative of the strength that he presents. But I think, you know, I, I think the, the Russian people, not only now, but throughout um, all history, um, do admire a stronger leader. And I think, at least in the West, I think there's a lot of um, uh, certain bias against Russian people. Um, or the the Russian governance, especially can, people who have never met Russians. I was at this uh, political event the other day, and I was uh, I overheard this conversation, and this this individual mentioned that he had a friend who's Russian, and I have a few friends who are Russian as well. And this uh, this girl was astounded. She said, um, and I, in quotes, I'll say, "You know someone who's Russian," which was absolutely absolutely crazy because she assumed that. Um, they were Russian and they were corrupt, but I think they are just like people anywhere else. And um, to quote one of my Russian friends, he said, and with respect to Putin, he does not. Um, uh, and I think this is counter to the to the Western narrative that we hear with respect to Putin. He he said he doesn't like Putin, but he likes what Putin is doing. So I think the Western narrative is the complete opposite. I think the Western narrative is is that. Um, they don't like what he's doing, but they might actually like who he is. So I think just the Western narrative is wrong. And obviously, you know, he won the last election with 76% of the vote, despite the, the recession that Russia went through. So even if the elections are completely false, you know, if they're falsifying all their votes, there's still a lot of people who are um, voting for him. And I think that, you know, the, the those people can't be can't be ignored and their wishes can't be can't be neglected so he came to he came to power for a reason and i think that uh, to automatically discount him based on a few things that could even be false would be um would be uh unethical and a, a, a falsity so yeah we'll talk more about putin as we get into the comparison with moon jay in so moon jay in is a, a more uh, recent leader he only just came into power He's a South Korean politician. Uh, the Republic of Korea um, is the actual correct name. Um, he's the president of South Korea and since 2017, um, so very recently, similar to Cyril Ramaphosa from our last uh, video. 
He was elected after the impeachment of Park Gwen Hai, who is pretty much, I guess you could consider him his political rival throughout um, at least his original rise to presidency. And he also served as a candidate of the Democratic um, well, during this time, he was a candidate of the Democratic Party of Korea, which is the centrist party in Korea. But he actually, as we'll see, he actually moves from party to party. So um, I think that's an interesting thing to note. He's also a student activist, a human rights lawyer, a founder of a newspaper. He's a co-founder of a newspaper. He is a former chief of staff to President Ro Muhyun, who was his mentor. You could see a, a parallel here with Putin and Yeltsin, as I'll uh, elaborate on further and very soon. Um, mm. he, used, he was the leader of the Democratic Party of Korea from 2015 to 2016. Um, he was member of the 19th National Assembly from 2012 to 2016, and he was formerly actually a candidate for the presidential elections in 2012 for the United Party. Democratic United Party, where he actually narrowly lost to his rival Park Gwen Hai. So he actually moved from party to party. This original party, the uh, Democratic Union, uh, Democratic United Party, is actually a little bit more left leaning than the current one he is with. But um, I think it, we'll, I'll elaborate on that later. But I think it's interesting to note politicians who move political parties. So to start off with his earlier life. Um, he uh, was born upon the end of the Korean War, which um, actually my grandfather on my mother's side fought in the Korean War. He was an artillery officer, Scottish artillery officer. He was actually doing mostly the, the calculations and uh, firing the missiles off. Uh, my other father on my father's side was a Navy, um, Navy soldier in the World War II. Um, fighting against Nazi Germany. So both uh, both my grandfathers, uh, for anyone who uh, might be interested, were both uh, soldiers. And then even going further back, I imagine there was more and more violence in the past. So yeah, either way, um, he was born at the end of the Korean War um, in Jio Joji, uh, which is in South Korea. It's an island uh, off the port of Busan, it's got uh, the city itself is actually made of multiple smaller islands even and it's known for Daewoo shipbuilding and marine engineering a big industrial company as well as Samsung heavy industries so big a pretty industrial town but it's also beautiful and known for uh, having many uh, tourists uh, coming just to look at its beauty he's the second of five children however he is the eldest boy uh, which I think is, is important to note his parents Moon Young Hyung and Kang Han Ok were refugees from Hong An, from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea during the Hong Nam evacuation. Uh, before the uh, evacuation, his father was the head of an agricultural department that detained um, food, particularly rice that was coming into North Korea from Korean colonials. And this was one of the main tasks for the Hyungam area. So, yeah, essentially his father was working um, probably by force in just collecting this rice and capturing this rice as a pretty high position. But um, after they settled in Busan, after the evacuation, he his father didn't want anything to do with a government job. So he worked to selling uh, to sell socks, which I think is, well, he actually made little money and accumulated a lot of debt. So um, he didn't actually do too well. And his mother was the main breadwinner selling clothing she collected from relief organizations and briquettes, which are used for kindling and fuel for fire. So um, firstly, I think what his father did, although he did not do it well and accumulated a lot of debt that ultimately came upon Moon, uh, I think selling socks is a very, at least, noble thing. He's not selling, you know, cigarettes or something like that. Socks are something very foundational that everyone needs. And his mother as well also served foundational things, clothing and briquettes, which is even more foundational. Heat probably comes even before clothing. But his mother um, generated a little bit more money. But she was the main breadwinner, but uh, they were still extremely poor. That's where we'll get to the first quote here. I cannot ride a bike since my family was too desperately poor to afford a bike or monthly school tuition. So he was so poor that he could not even ever have the chance to learn to ride a bike. 
his family joined the Catholic Church and they got became very attached to it because his mother would um, travel to the local cathedral every so often to receive whole milk powder. So very, very helpful for them. Um, yeah, he went to Kyungnam High School in Busan and he was top of his class. So at least a, a very good student, which helped him rise out of the poverty he was born into. He studied law at Kyunghee University with a full scholarship. It's a, this is a private university. It's considered probably top 10 in um, Korea. And obviously he probably went for his scholarship. Even some of the other top universities that might even be higher ranked, he probably wouldn't have been able to do it financially. But during this time, he organized a student protest against the Yushin Constitution, which was part of the Fourth Republic of Korea, um, which was under democratic or even autocratic and um, was ultimately the constitution was replaced in 1981 with the fourth republic of korea but despite this for organizing this protest he was arrested convicted and expelled he later conscripted into the military after this being expelled from university and well he was conscripted because he was by force and he was assigned to the south korean special forces he supposedly um, worked during the Operation Paul Banyan, after, which was an intimidation effort against the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, or North Korea, uh, following the murder of two Americans called the Axe Murder Incident. This was in 1978, and he was 25, uh, 23 years old at this time. Uh, after his father died, he was discharged, and he decided um, after the death of his father that he should complete the bar exam. So he studied at a Buddhist temple known as Dae Hyun Sun, um, and he passed the first two levels in 1979 when he was 26 years old. In 1980, he completed the remaining year of his studies at university and returned and passed his final level of the bar at um, that year when he was 27 years old. He passed university at the second in his class, However, he was not permitted to be a judge or state prosecutor due to his activism against um, Park Chung-hee's dictatorship. So um, that little political activism really stuck with him um, throughout his life. But nonetheless, it ultimately allowed him to meet his great mentor. So it was probably better that he did this. So yeah, he was admitted to the Judicial Research and Training Institute, but he could not become a judge or a state official. So he, dis he went into private practice after having passed the bar exam, and he partnered and worked with Ro Mu Hyun uh, starting in the early 1980s. So um, this is um, his mentor, who ultimately becomes president of Korea and very much facilitated his own rise. So very, very important advisor that is a, uh, clearly a parallel to Putin. And also always um the, i find mentorship relations are interesting is it the mentor who finds or chooses the mentee or is it the mentee that chooses the mentor it's probably a combination of the both but nonetheless um this relationship happened for a reason and was very much important to him he was um he took cases similar to ru uh, uh, ro mu hyun um in terms of labor rights issues and he actually became somewhat renowned for uh, his stance on defending labor rights. He remained friends with Roe, the chief, and who ultimately appointed him to chief of staff even, until Roe actually committed suicide in 2009. He also, in 1988, was a founding member of the progressive newspaper, The Blankura, um, when he was 35 years old. So a parallel could be seen with maybe Benjamin Franklin in that he um, was an advocate for free speech as well which was already free speech already at this time existed but he believed in the value and importance of newspapers so his political career started when his mentor ru myu hyun um, asked him to be a campaign manager um this was seven years later um or sorry um uh, he, ru, uh, it's important to note i think that ru was a row was seven, about seven years older than uh, Moon. So um, older, but not too much older. So there was obviously, um, um, but I think seven years is a pretty ideal age gap between two individuals where um, one will still be in power where they may choose their successor. 
Um, he, after this, he became a senior presidential secretary for civil affairs as Roe became president, or Roe became president. He became a senior presidential secretary for civil society and chief presidential secretary, which he held from 2003 to 2008. It's said that during this time, um, after uh, Roe um, passed away and he had to decide whether or not he'd go into politics, he was actually originally indifferent. Um, that's what he as he wrote in his memoirs, um, I was originally indifferent to politics, that's as the quote on the page says. Um, however, due to the conservative decline and the scandals that were seen on the more conservative competitors, such as um, his rival Park yun hye he slowly re rose to power. And uh, there were many impeachments during this time. As mentioned, he actually lost in 2012, running for a slightly more uh, left-wing party against Park. However, um, she ultimately was impeached, and he won the presidency in the most recent election in 2017. His campaigns throughout both elections, 2012 and 2017, focused on providing funding for um, startups and um, small businesses. So... Um, I guess just his both his parents you could say were in some ways entrepreneurs and I think he has that sort of entrepreneurial blood but also sort of a dislike for the big and powerful he did not like the big and powerful government he experienced when uh, or his parents experienced in North Korea and his father did not want to work in government for that very reason and I think he still has that and that's why maybe he was originally indifferent to politics he preferred the smaller enterprises that's why I think you know even some of the biggest law firms in the world are still, you know, partnerships. They're very still quite small. So he still has that sort of entrepreneurial uh, belief. Similarly, he was also a founding member of a newspaper, which is also very entrepreneurial as well. Uh, it, but however, in 2019, um, just to kind of um, narrate a little bit about his presidency thus far, they had 4.5% unemployment, which is the highest since 2012. So um, worse unemployment that, than that which was achieved during the time of Park Gwen Hai. He is famous because he is um, only the third president of South Korea to have met with Kim Jong-un. He met during three summits in 2018, in May, April, and September, or April, May, and September. And in June 30th of 2019, he met again with Kim Jong-un, with Donald Trump as well in the demilitarized zone. So I think he is, and I think it's very often it's through his rhetoric, that he would like to see at least, um, maybe not necessarily a reunited North Korea, but at least the freedom achieved for North Koreans. So uh, going back with the respect to the, the higher unemployment rate, once again, we could use either a prescribed to or unprescribed, the Tolstoyan argument is, um, is is it his fault or is it not his fault? It could just be economic concern, faults, which would be the Tolstoyan argument, or it's all his fault, which would be the non-Tolstoyan, the great, um, uh, great man theory. And if we do prescribe to that, everything that goes good in South Korea, we also have to prescribe to him. So we have to be equal with that regards. So nonetheless, he's a very new leader and he, um, he does advocate for international trade. But um, yeah, we'll go into the quotes here. I cannot ride a bike since my family was too desperately poor to afford a bike or monthly school tuition, as we mentioned before, very poor upbringing. Um, I was originally indifferent to politics, as we mentioned. Um, I am pro-US, but now South Korea should adopt a diplomacy in which it can discuss a US request and say no to Americans. So he is obviously pro-US, but he also thinks that South Korea should have some more um, be a little bit more independent, which is, I think, a, a key point of his policy and which differs from some of his predecessors where they advocated solely for closer relations with, um, with um, the U.S. So, and last but not least, and I think this sums up both of these uh, characters or um, leaders best and will lead into the comparison best. When I drink a little, I sometimes recall my old days. Then I ask myself, what does Ro Mu Hyun mean in my life? He really defined my life. My life would have changed a lot if I did not meet him. So he is my destiny. 
So I think to start the comparison here, I think the most important thing to note is that both of these individuals rose to power through mentorship. They, despite, um, you know, Moon was a top student, but, you know, his career was completely shattered as a result of his political activism. Putin, um, he was part of the um, under democratic side, he was a senior leader in the KGB, but he gave it all up, which ultimately probably won him the respect of of Yeltsin, as well as other uh, Anatoly, his other mentor throughout university, um, helped him rise in terms of municipal politics, which was also incredibly important. So, I think that is like the the most defining uh, similarity between these other individuals. In terms of differences, I think perhaps, um, I think a lot of people assume that Putin had it easy going because his father was a, um, a cook for, for Vladimir Lenin. But I think just like anyone else, he had to rise through the ranks and he did so mostly just through being a hard worker. And I think the same thing applies to Moon. He, he climbed through the ranks essentially through being a hard worker. He had the best grades in his school, the second grades in his university. And despite his poor upbringing, he still managed to rise from that regard. Um, yeah, now we'll go into the pictures and I think we'll conclude it there. So this one here at the top, starting with Putin, is the, um, the, the flag or of the president of Russia. This here is obviously the Russian flag. This is the flag of the former KGB, the, or this, uh, the, the coat of arms of the KGB. This is the uh, coat of arms of the FSB, the, um, the new, uh, the successor to the KGB, and this is the flag of the Soviet Union. The um, this is the seal of the president of South Korea or the Republic of Korea. This is the flag of Korea, and this is the 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 flag of North Korea. In terms of population, um, uh, Russia has 144.5 million people, whereas South Korea has 51.5 million people. So almost a, a, a Russia almost has three times as many people, whereas their GDPs are actually quite similar. The GDP of Russia is 1.578 trillion, whereas the GDP of South Korea is 1.531 trillion. So very close GDPs. However, Russia almost has three times the population. Then with respect to, to size, Russia is obviously much, much larger at 17.1 million kilometers squared, whereas... Um, South Korea is not even 1 million at 100,210 100, kilometers squared, so much, much smaller. So per capita and um, um, the people in South Korea have much, much more money, but much, much less land. So yeah, that is the life of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin and Moon J in. So I hope you enjoy this video and I hope you watch some of the ones I will be making in the future and some of the ones I'll be making that I've made in the past. So yeah, thanks.